This evening, I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Ashkan, who is the Professor of Neurosurgery at King's. And I'm sure you've had a very, very busy day operating. So we're very pleased that you've taken some time out of your busy life to share some of your thoughts with our community. So as you know, we've spoken about a number of times, there are a lot of people who are really worried right now, uh, who are living with a brain tumour. And they're worried that their treatment's been postponed or their scans have been cancelled or their surgery's been rescheduled. So tell us a little bit about what, why that is and how worried should people do, be and how things are for you at King's. Hi, sir. Uh as, as you know, these are truly unprecedented times, uh, like of which we've never seen in this country during our lifetime. And I doubt if many other countries have also experienced uh, such challenges that we are facing at the moment. This is a truly rapidly moving field and we are learning every day about this virus and what we can do to try to cope with this. Because of these challenges, one thing we do need to do is to work creatively and work in a different way than the standard, than the way we have been working for the past few years. What I want to be very clear is that this change in the way we work and deliver the service does not mean that we're abandoning our patients. The same doctors, the same nurses, the same NHS that has looked after the patients with cancer and brain tumors all these many years continues to think about these patients, continues to do what is best, continues to do what they can do best in the current challenging circumstances for these patients. There is no question of them being abandoned at all. Do you know, Ash, know that's, really, uh, that's really useful to hear you say that because I think some people feel as though their uh, normal clinical team um, perhaps are abandoning them a little bit because they've been sidetracked onto solely dealing with patients with coronavirus and that maybe they don't have time for them anymore. Perhaps what you're suggesting is that actually isn't the case. No, I think that's absolutely right. These are challenging times and it is true that some of our resources are understandably being diverted in trying to deal with this major crisis that we are facing worldwide with this virus. But that does not mean that we are forgetting about our patients with brain cancer. As you say, I know many patients are wondering what is happening with the decision-making process, who is making the decisions. Mm. I want to be very clear that uh, in line with the NHS guidelines and also the guidelines uh, issued by the Society of British Neurological Surgeons, it is still the same multidisciplinary team as before making these decisions even now for these patients. So the same MDT, the same team of doctors and specialists making these decisions, although perhaps working in a different way. As you know, I work in Kings, and if, you have, if anybody ever attends one of our MDTs, multidisciplinary team meetings in Kings, the famous saying is that there is no seat to find because the room is packed with dozens and dozens of doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals. So clearly we can't do that in these current circumstances. So we do things differently. We have virtual MDTs, or if you're having physical MDTs, we limit the number of people present. So instead of having four neurosurgeons attending, we can do with one or two. Instead of having five neuro-oncologists attending, we can do that with one or two. So we are limiting the number of people in the MDT, but that doesn't affect the quality of the service that we are running. We still have the clinical specialists, we still have the neuroradiologists, we still have the neuropathologists and all the other key members of the MDT in order to make a correct and uh, informed decision for our patients. So Again, even said, though things might look different uh, for us from the outside, on the inside, actually you're still operating using the same procedures, making decisions in the same way. So really, people should be reassured by that. Yes, I think over, overall that's absolutely correct. Uh, as I say, clearly these are challenging times and a proportion of our, of our resources are diverted quite rightly in order to try to cope with this worldwide crisis of the coronavirus. But that does not mean that we stopped caring about our brain tumor patients. We stopped doing all our services. We have to adopt, we have to change to the current uh, situation and the current circumstances. So clearly we don't have the full body of people attending the MDT as usual, but the key people are still there. And even if you have to have a reduced MDT, it's not as if we're totally abandoning the procedure and mm -hmm. the decision making is not happening outside the standard that mm -hmm. we were having before. So mm -hmm. different ways of working, 
clearly we have to adopt. There is no hiding the fact that these are very challenging times, but adopting and changing the procedure does not mean that we stop caring for our patients. Mm. I think the same thing applies with what you were saying about patients worrying about the treatment delays. Mm. So again, a lot of patients may think that this is purely a resource issue. Clearly resources are challenged in the current circumstances, but it is not just about resources. Doctors and nurses in the NHS have always been very good at balancing the risk and benefits. And now into the same equation, we need to introduce the extra factor of coronavirus. So every time we want to make a decision about treatment, we need to look at the benefits of bring a patient to a hospital environment to have the treatment delivered versus the risks of doing so. Because clearly hospitals are uh, probably higher risk of infection for understandable reasons. Clearly more risk of infection in a hospital environment than the safety of a patient's home if they are especially uh, self-isolating or self-socially mm -hmm. distancing themselves. Clearly very important for many of our patients with cancer. So what does that mean? So that means that if a treatment can be safely delayed for one or two months, then that's perhaps the best way forward at the moment. So for a neurosurgeon such as myself, we've made a decision that those benign tumors, which are not emergencies, the treatment for surgery should be delayed by a month or two whilst we are getting on top of the current crisis with the healthcare uh, uh, challenge by the coronavirus. Uh, and for my neuro-oncologist colleagues, I, I don't envy them. They have got the challenge of trying to balance the risk and benefits of, for example, administering chemotherapy to the patients with malignant brain tumors and clearly chemotherapy does mean uh, potential immunosuppression and significantly higher risk of developing infection or if they do develop infection then much higher risks uh, of uh, coming to some sort of harm because of that infection and clearly they need to balance the risk and benefit in every single patient mm. to see what is right continuing or starting chemotherapy or whether it is the safest option not to do that at this point in time because of the risk of introducing infection. Mm -hmm. So I think all those things are uh, very important and uh, you continuously think about delivering the service the best we can within these challenging circumstances and situations as we are at the present time. Mm -hmm. It's really useful to hear you talk about um, the clinical team thinking about the balance of risk because for those of us on the outside, it feels sometimes a little bit like uh, the resources are being used for other patients. But actually, what you're saying is actually the clinician will make a decision about the risk for you as a person, not everyone else in the hospital, but for you as a person. And actually, if it's too risky for you to come in and have your treatment or your scan, they're putting you first and you're right at the center of that decision. Absolutely. We do those kind of decisions when we have plenty of resources, yep. like every day, like a month ago, like two months ago. Yeah. We continue to do the same decisions now with less resources, but the resource factor does not change the way overall we think about risk and benefit ratios. But clearly, within the current resources, those decisions are even harder to make and we have to think even harder. Mm. i just like to give two messages to uh, 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 if, if that's okay, first message is for our patients with uh, tumors, with brain tumors or tumors in general. And the second message is, I think, for the society as a whole, if I may. For our patients, what I want to say is that these are clearly very challenging times, but they need to be reassured that we are not abandoning them. The doctors, the nurses, and the NHS is doing everything it can in the current challenging times to deliver them the best and the safest treatment possible. It's a constant battle, understand, but we are fighting for you the best that we can. Yeah. What I want to say to society is that you need to look at the history. This is definitely not the first challenge that has been thrown to humankind, and I'm sure it will not be the last challenge either. But what the history has shown to us is that every time humankind wins these battles, what we need to do is to have hope, we need to have resilience, and we need to have expert advice. And I'm really glad that recently we've been getting plenty of updates from the NHS process, the health minister and the government as a whole. It's important to listen to the expert advice. It's absolutely critical to remain safe, stay at home, because together I'm sure we can win this battle. Thank you very much, Ash. Certainly talking about hope and resilience and expert advice is exactly what you've given us this evening. So thank you so much for your advice. And I know everyone watching this in their homes being safe at home will be greatly reassured by that. So thank you very much. Do you think things are going to change in the next couple of weeks? Do you think the demands on hospitals are going to get even worse? 
So uh, obviously I'm not an epidemiologist or a virology expert, but clearly listening to the experts, it seems that we still haven't hit the peak of this uh, viral problem. And it seems that we still got a few more weeks or maybe a limited number of months that the situation will remain challenging. From what I hear, the peak is going to be hit in about one and a half, three weeks from now. So I expect the situation to get worse before it gets better. Uh, but obviously, we're getting plenty of expert advice. And I think the society as a whole should follow this advice mm -hmm. to try to reduce the burden on the NHS and on the doctors and health services. Because the less stretched we are dealing with this COVID, with this viral illness problem, the more resources we have to give to our other patients. And that's particularly important for mm -hmm. our cancer Page. Yeah, that's a really valid point. And if someone's condition changes and they feel as though things are worsening, can a previous decision to either withdraw treatment or to cancel this scan, can those decisions be changed again if their condition worsens? Sure. I think it's very important to have a constant dialogue between the patients and the key worker and the treating team. Uh, as I said, our clinical nurse specialists have always flown the flag for our patients, and I'm sure they will be a very good point of contact to discuss any concerns. And clearly, if the situation changes, uh, then uh, the treatment and decision on the treatment may have to change as well. So I think my best advice would be to keep in touch with your treating mm. team, update them, and, and follow the advice. Mm. And I guess this is a really tricky question, and I know it's one that you don't want to hear, but if uh, someone really disagrees with the decision that's made by their treatment team um, about them and what should happen, and they think it's coronavirus related, what should they be doing then? Is it worth looking for a second opinion or talking to the patient advisory liaison service? What should they do in the situation where they just can't accept the decision that's made for them? I think those situations, actually, you and your organization uh, and other charities will probably play the most important pivotal roles. You are potentially in better position to discuss the concerns of the patients. And sometimes by the fact that you have perhaps more time than the, the teams that are uh, potentially challenged by all the various issues that have been thrown at them, you might be able to explore it with the patients better and, uh, and advise best. Mm -hmm. And yes, occasionally, I guess, arranging second opinions or recommending for second opinions may be a possibility, but clearly this issue is challenging the whole country. And I think most units sooner or later may face the same challenges that, uh, for example, at the moment we are facing in Southeast and the London mm -hmm. area. And I'm sure you're talking to your colleagues across the UK. Uh, are you seeing similarly stretched services uh, right up and down the country or is it predominantly in London and the Southeast currently? As you know, the majority of cases at the moment are in the London and Southeast area. But as this pandemic expands, as you know, we expect the rest of the country to follow at certain time, maybe days or weeks after uh, the situation in London. Uh, so clearly, this is something that can has the potential of compromising services up and down the country. And that's why it is so important for people to take the government's advice seriously, stay at home unless it's absolutely necessary for them to, and try to avoid contacting other uh, people because this virus can only spread by us contacting each other. It's mm -hmm. not going to spread if you're sitting at home and we are not uh, contact, in contact with other people. Mm. I think you met your comment around when we follow the advice given to us by government and absolutely everybody should be doing that. But you gave an additional comment where you said it means that more resources will then be available to help those people who are living and, and dying of a, a brain tumor today. So that's a really valuable uh, comment to make because sometimes we think that the reason we're staying at home is just to stop the spread of the virus, which is of course absolutely critical. But of course, there's another part to that, that the more resources being used for the virus, the less that could be available for our community. So actually by staying at home Absolutely. and following advice, we're helping both things. Absolutely. I think that the Prime Minister uh, motto, save the NHS, uh, mm. is very valid. It doesn't say save the coronavirus or save the regulatory and IT facilities in the NHS. It says save the NHS because yeah. if you follow that advice and if you remain safe, the NHS as a whole and NHS is then there to serve all the population whether it's brain tumor patients, there is coronavirus patients, or there is trauma patients, or a whole gamut of other specialties. We need the NHS to look after 
all the conditions in this country like it has for decades. Mm -hmm. And I think NHS has looked after us. It's about we are sort of looking after us because we need it for us now and we need it for our future generations. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Ash. I know you've had a very, very busy week and we're very grateful for you. Uh, and you're in your home doing this recording for us. So we're very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah.